Today, we're here to discuss building AI for startups uh, with Jocelyn Goldfein. And Jocelyn will be shedding light on why right now might actually be a great time to start a company. So she'll highlight uh, a number of the different opportunities and challenges that AI startups face. So Jocelyn and Jerry are going to come up to chat for about 20 minutes. And then we have a few community members who are joining us uh, live for a conversation with Jocelyn as well. So without further ado, let us welcome Jocelyn Goldfein. Um, so Jocelyn is the managing director at Zeta Venture Partners. Her career as an engineering leader spans from early stage startups to high growth companies. And she was the former engineering director at Facebook. She invests in the intelligent enterprise and early stage startups applying AI to solve business problems. She's particularly excited about the potential of AI to optimize infrastructure, security, supply chain, and worker productivity. Welcome, Jocelyn. Thank you so much for joining us. Patrick, thank you so much. What a, what a warm introduction. You are so welcome. But so before I hand you off to Jerry, we have a couple quick questions so people can get to know you beyond the bio, if you're ready. Okay. Okay. Can you share your most used emoji? It's probably just a conventional smiley face. Thumbs up. It's definitely the thumbs up, actually. Yes. Wonderful. Can you share... What fictional world or place would you like to visit? Man, no, I got to pass on this one. I, I'm a total bookworm and I read a zillion books. So it's not <laughs> like there's only one book in my head. There's like way too many. A combination of all of the worlds that you've yes, traveled to. Yes, I can't even decide between fantasy and science fiction here. You got to keep going. <laughs> okay, we'll table that one. I just finished Dune. So I'm, a, I'm totally in, the, in that world right now. I don't think I'd want to visit that world. That's a good, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to read about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here's a, here's a different one. So this is a good binary one. So mm -hmm. would you rather travel back in time to visit your ancestors or forward in time to visit your descendants? Definitely forward. I don't want to deal with cholera or dysentery. <laughs> that's, that's great. I think it's a good judgment call. Um, okay. So I I'm just like an optimist about the future too. So it would be good to have the, you know, the payoff. Yeah, I had a feeling if we're here to talk about artificial intelligence, <laughs> it, it has a little bit of a forward looking future there. That's right. Um, okay. So this one would be, you're, since you're a bookworm, this might be also difficult, but <laughs> oh, what's no. a, what's a book you've read that's changed your life? Oh, um, okay. When I was a teen, probably like a lot of people, it was just like, so relatable for those of us who, you know, felt under recognized, under appreciated, um, but that, you know, we could brilliance our way out into, into recognition. Um, I would say as an adult, a nonfiction book called Influence by Robert Cialdini, I think as an engineer, um, I really felt myself to be rational. I felt that other people should be rational. I felt that the way, you know, communication should occur and decisions should be made is that, you know, all the, all the information and truth is laid out on the table and then like, you know, the truth emerges. Um, and I think Influence taught me, you know, not to be frustrated when it didn't go like that because that's not how it's going to go. Like human communication and decision-making is a systems problem and it's way more complex than that. Those are incredible recommendations. And there's a young Patrick doing backflips at the recommendation of, of Ender's Game in so much excitement. That was such a formative book in, in my, my, my youth. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sure many other people uh, agree. So um, actually we read it recently. It's been a, you know, coronavirus has given me a lot of extra reading time. That's wonderful. I have one more question for you, Jocelyn, mm -hmm. and this might actually transition really well into our topic. Mm -hmm. um, so in, you know, in, in venture capital, I imagine beyond, you know, picking great technology and, and business ideas, uh, part of it is like you're, you're oftentimes assessing different teams. So this is a team, a team assessment question for you. The zombie apocalypse is coming. Who are the three people you want on your team? Dang. Like, like not, uh, not by role, but by, by ability. I don't think yeah. I know the right people. Like I definitely want someone who is, I think in the zombie apocalypse, you want someone with lots of survivalism skills. You want somebody with uh, weaponry skills and you want somebody with uh, medical skills. I don't know. I'd have to sort of work my way down my Rolodex to figure out that's probably <laughs> not any of my immediate friends and family. Unfortunately, all our like, you know, keyboard jockey skills would be pretty worthless. So I might have to expand beyond my inner circle. Well, we may have some people willing to, to, to try out for it. So um, we figured, <laughs> you know, Sometimes now it can feel almost like the apocalypse and maybe even the business apocalypse with what's going on. And so um, it's in some ways, but what we're really excited about is for you to shed light on where the opportunity is in that. And so with that, uh, I'd like to transition, uh, Jerry, take it away. 
Great, thanks, Patrick, and uh, exciting to have this opportunity to chat with Jocelyn again. Um, and as uh, my biggest question, and also this is a question for a lot of attendees as well, um, as the pandemic hits us, so how do you see the landscape of VC world and startups? Uh, what about AI for startups? Do you see a more positive impact or a negative impact? Um, I yeah, I, this hit abruptly and um, and definitely kind of abruptly and, and sort of gradually both. Um, I think that, you know, the abrupt part was the like immediate slamming of the brakes caused by shelter in place and quarantine. Um, I think every, every company in the portfolio experienced that. Um, and, uh, and what we did as investors is sit down with every single CEO we work with and work out a replan. I mean, there's no company that doesn't have some flavor of, of replanning going on because of this. And um, I would say it took a few weeks to sort of exactly figure out what the impact would be, I think. Um, and I should say, by the way, that, that um, I invest only in startups with B2B business models. So I think consumer is a whole other flavor of uh, reaction. Um, and, and I would say that what what I'm seeing is that this, um, this, this, this pandemic is, um, it, it's a pandemic and it's a recession, right? We have the impact of shelter in place and how that's, you know, really drastically reshaping whole industries. And then we also have kind of the foreknowledge that, you know, even if, even if consumer spending is normal today or the market is normal today with 20% unemployment numbers, we're looking at a long deep dip. And we have some experience to guide us on, on how to manage through that. Even if we're not seeing the impact right away, we can anticipate. So, um, and so we've been sort of managing both those things company by company. And I would say what's really interesting about this versus prior recessions is that um, the impact is so idiosyncratic sector by sector. And I would not say that AI companies are particularly different or special here, except insofar as if you're in the business of selling, you know, frameworks or tools to support data science and AI, you are probably one of the fortunate companies that's the beneficiary of a tailwind here. Because, um, you know, if I look through our portfolio sort of sector by sector, if you serve brick and mortar retailers, if you serve the travel or the hospitality industry, you, you are toast. Your customers have, are just, um, you know, not making discretionary purposes, purchases, not paying their bills in some cases. Your re revenue is churning because your customers are actually going out of business. Hor you know, horrifying. Um, and, but also out of your control. It's not because you did something wrong. It's, it's, this was, a, you know, could not have been anticipated. Um, and those sectors will return someday. Um, uh, there are, but there are also sectors that um, are seeing actually a lot of lift. So for example, e-commerce is a sector where, you know, we, we back a startup that provides a search engine for e-commerce sites. They power things like jet.com or Sephora. They, um, they are seeing 70% boosts in search traffic. They're seeing many, many days come within, you know, 10% of a Black Friday. So there's, there's actually the, the, the abrupt, you know, shelter in place really transitioned consumer demand really rapidly and abruptly from offline to online. Um, and that's creating a tailwind for, for technology vendors who help people. Another thing that we've seen is that um, pharmaceutical and financial services, you know, big companies with deep pockets um, are actually redoubling their data science efforts. So they, um, they are turning to data science, we assume, to help with drug discovery, to help with identifying perhaps therapies or tests, um, and, uh, and, and are looking for ways to accelerate clinical trials. So these are all causing a deeper investment. So if you work in data science right now, I would say that it's as healthy a job market for you as ever. And if you sell tools that make data scientists more efficient, more productive, you probably are finding this boom times too. Um, and so it's just, um, you know, what, what I find and just, and then, you know, for companies who are sort of more run of the mill, you know, let me business process improvement, let me manage your infrastructure more effectively. I'd say there's sort of a couple of months there where everything hit pause, where people, you know, were suddenly thrust at home. They couldn't make decisions. They couldn't figure out how to push things through procurement. Um, you know, sort of enterprise sales was just sort of on hold. I would say as of early May, the resume button has been hit and things are kind of, and I'd be interested to hear from the audience what everybody else is seeing too, but um, maybe in Slack is the best way. Um, but it seems like, uh, you know, like, like, like business is moving again. People have figured out, okay, shelter in place isn't going away, but this is how we're going to get business done anyway. So it's very sector by sector. It's very idiosyncratic. Um, AI tools is, is one of the, the many bright spots and, you know, we don't control the cards we're dealt, but we do control how we play them. And so that's what I've really focused on with, with every company I work with. Got it. And probably that means you are even more busier now because <laughs> the, uh, the new <laughs> is coming up. You know what? 
we we had the good fortune we we had we were um we spent Q, um late last year started raising our third fund and we actually closed it on march 20th and so um so in some ways um i got a huge amount of my time back on march 21st that was going towards fundraising that i can now spend on uh, on working with companies and i, I can tell you which of those two things i prefer <laughs> And, uh, um, probably the same as most startup CEOs. I'd, I'd much rather, <laughs> rather be uh, working on the company than, than raising money. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are the, some, some areas you think uh, with the pandemic and what's going on right now, the new normal, uh, are mm -hmm. having uh, new opportunities that are sort of um, underutilized or undervalued? So there is uh, a direction that you can point people to. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people in the community that are sort of still in the idea searching phase. So uh, even mm -hmm. in, any ponders on that, I think that can be helpful for an audience. Yeah, it's tricky. You know, I think there's, um, you, you don't want to necessarily build a whole company around COVID-19 because it's not clear that that's a long, you know, that that's a company with longevity. Um, but, you know, for sure, I think things that are durable that are, that have a tailwind with COVID. Um, but, but then, how, you know, have a durable big market and business beyond COVID. Um, so, you know, I don't know if contact tracing is is going to be a long lived business, but um, though sure valuable in the short term. Um, but uh, but you know, something that accelerates clinical trials um, is is probably you know extraordinarily useful right now, and also um, you know for evergreen. Mm. So, if there if there are ideas that I'm longing to see somebody tackle. Mm. I mean, I, you know, I can tell you areas I'm excited about and, yeah. and, and, and I, that, that aren't, you know, particularly COVID triggered um, because I just, you know, I invest over a 10 year time horizon. So I just don't think that COVID in itself is, is a company. Um, I am, I am, I mean, I do think in terms of what, what is new normal, I think actually it really, I, like, I'm not of the opinion that like life as we know it is forever changed and that, you know, I mean, it, it may be that higher ed um, goes through some changes because of this, but I am actually of the opinion that higher ed is going to return to normal once there's a vaccine and is going to do its best to, to sort of juggle a hybrid model in between. Same thing with remote work. I think companies will become, you know, after enforcing remote work, I think they'll become more friendly to remote work. But I think a world where like, you know, everybody is a distributed first company, I don't think that's super, super likely. I think things, I think tools that assist with remote work are obviously doing super well right now. I mean, you've not just sort of the obvious Zoom and Slack two tools that we are all using right now, um, but Atlassian is booming, you know, I, I, those, those kinds of things. Um, you know, so I think any any sort of fundamental communication and productivity tools um, always have value and always will. Um, something I'm hearing a lot from enterprise customers is that they've realized that without the ability to sort of for managers to physically see and be around teammates, they're interested in more ways um, to, to, to digitally measure how people are performing and working. Not so much kind of the big brother, like, did you phone it in or did you actually do the work? But more like, you know, how can I even tell what's, what's going on, what progress is being made, where people are stuck or blocked on each other? Um, so I think there's, there's always, that's, that's like a, a really great category. Like I've always been interested in how, how we can use technology to make people more productive. Um, so I think that that, that space is, has been good, will be good. Um, will create value in the world. Uh, something that I'm perpetually interested in that's, that's not to do with COVID particularly is, is climate change. I think one thing, you know, often when people think about AI, they think about its power to do things more efficiently and more cost effectively than a human being. But, I, you know, I think that in many cases, you know, just saving money is not the be all end all, even to, to, to business customers. And, you know, when I get really, really excited about AI, it's when I think about the problems that are too hard for human beings that humans armed with AI are able to solve. And, you know, that's the big scary things like climate change, um, like, like um, you know, I think global recessions always sort of reteach us the lesson of how intertwined our global economies are and that we can't anticipate that like, you know, an illness in Italy is actually gonna have this impact on China, which will have this impact in Africa or the US. Right. That, these interlinkages are too complex for human beings to forecast impacts. So the ability to kind of simulate or understand how interconnected we all are. So sort of global economic intersections, I think is something that can be optimized with AI. Um, I remain, you know, cybersecurity may sound, I don't know, pedestrian, if it sounds pedestrian to you, but like right now, um, 
you know, the, the black hats are not taking a day off, just the opposite. Like one of the worst kind of pandemic profiteers, like we all know about people jacking up prices on hand sanitizer, but like somebody who decides that now is the right time to unleash a ransomware attack on a hospital until it's paid off in Bitcoin is like the worst kind of pandemic profiteer and they're going full, full throttle. And so I think that, um, you know, cybersecurity is an inherently asymmetric problem. Attackers only need to find one vulnerability. Defenders need to defend everything. And so I think our only hope is AI. So I, I could go on and on. I mean, really, I could talk all day about the ways that AI can, can help make us, you know, help us solve this, this collection of problems in front of us and then the problems in the future. So maybe I'll, I'll just pause there and, and uh, take some more questions. Well, thanks. Uh, it's very helpful. And uh, I really like the, the perspective you share, like looking at areas for AI, not just in terms of how much money can save us or how much time can save us, but also the magnitude of the, uh, uh, the difficulty of the challenge. So uh, that's, a, that's a very useful perspective uh, to think about. Um, what are the signs of the, uh, when you talk to, see uh, a team that are, uh, they are working on company. They start to approach conversation with you, and uh, so especially I, I know you are focusing on early stage companies. So, uh, what are the uh, it, what are the signs for you to tell whether a team is uh, that makes you excited versus the sign that you, it creates you know concerns for you? So, I think a lot of us are sort of in that boat. Uh, uh, just started to forming teams or funding co-founders and uh, it's really helpful for them to know uh, what to pay attention to. Yeah. Well, I, something that I think is true for all startups, but especially for AI startups is how important it is to marry, um, you know, technology innovation, like the ability to do something very cutting edge that other people cannot do with domain expertise. And, you know, I, you kind of always want domain expertise in a problem area because you want to know that you've got a founding team that has, you know, founder market fit, right? Like that has a founder problem fit that, that deeply understands the problem they're trying to solve. I think it's, you know, the graveyard of Silicon Valley is, is littered with, with, you know, people who had technology hubris that technology can go, you know, solve every problem and sort of charge in to tackle things without really understanding what was, whether it was a tech problem or not. Um, so I think that domain expertise is valuable in sort of picking your problem and solving it correctly and having the right product insight. But I think in AI companies in particular, um, because there's such a premium on, you know, you have this chicken and egg problem, which is, I want to build a model that makes some prediction or recommendation or has, uh, or generates some insight, but I cannot train my model to any accuracy without having some data. And until I have a model, a product that does something, I can't sell it to customers and get more data from my customers. So how do I bootstrap through that? And so I think that, um, that it's that coming from the domain, potentially having access to, to data sets to start with because of your domain connections and relationships, or even just the ability to sort of look at data and understand what it means. You know, I think I can't think of the number of times that I've sat down with a, you know, a data analyst who who spotted some correlation or some trend and like thought they were onto something big, but it was really a spurious connection. Like, um, you know, I'm thinking of like sitting at Facebook working with a, a data analyst on, you know, what makes recruiters productive and they're like, oh, it really makes recruiters productive if they have worked with the same hiring manager for a long time. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. But it also just makes them productive when they've been working on recruiting the same role for a long time because it takes six months to build a pipeline. So like, I think if you don't have a real understanding of what the data, where the data is coming from and, and what it means, I think it's really easy to trick yourself um, you know, the old cliche lies, damn lies in statistics. It's really easy to fool yourself or spot patterns and data that you think are there um, that don't mean what you think they mean. So I, I think deeply understanding your problem, deeply understanding your domain, and then the ability to do something innovative with it. I also, you know, far more often than I see a technology team with no, no domain expertise, you know, I see the, the opposite. I see a domain team that understands their problem really well and feels and just thinks AI is a magic wand. And so they come to me with a pitch and they tell me AI is going to do something. And I ask, have you built a model? No. Have you fed it any data? No, but we're going to have such cool data once we build this, once we once you give me money and let me build this product. And I'm like, okay, well, what's the, what data are you going to collect and what features are important and what are, what are you going to predict? What are you going to do with it? And when they start describing, you know, that their AI is going to do these things that sound like the kind of thing a management consultant would do, but not the kind of thing that's a good machine learning problem, then I know I'm, I'm probably like, that's a team that, you know, like I've never regretted not, not backing that team. Um, I think that they, you know, it's not just like in 12 months, hire a data scientist and, and magic will happen. Like you actually have to have an AI tractable problem. 
So I think you really need both. It's not one or the other. And how do you deal with the, the data problems? It's sort of a model and data chicken egg problem. How do you uh, typically help you to uh, like do you have the data first or uh, do you get funding or start building model and what's your suggestion there? Yeah, um, one, of our, one of our catchphrases for Zeta is that we like to invest post-data pre-traction and I, um, you know, but, the, but this begs the question from entrepreneurs, you know, how on earth do we get the data if we don't have traction? So, so there's a variety of ways to get it um, and, and different startups solve this through in, in different ways. Um, one way is certainly the way that I mentioned, which is founder comes from the domain, has proprietary access to data because of it. Either, you know, maybe I, uh, you know, own a small chain of healthcare clinics and then that gives me access to um, a variety like of anonymized patient data that I can use to train the first version of my model. Or maybe I, you know, have good relationships with, you know, a legacy vendor who has some data they're willing to, to do a data share arrangement with me. Um, it, uh, I've definitely seen startups that were successful by by scraping a public corpus where they were, were pulling, you know, malware data off of virus total or code data out of GitHub. Um, and uh, and then, you know, invest in doing a really good job of labeling that data. Um, and, um, you know, I think another like really interesting way is to have some kind of freemium consumer facing tool that, that you know, gives people a little bit of value for, for free and somehow manage to get some distribution for it, a little bit of data back in exchange for, for usage of that product. So these are all, you know, different creative ways. And I would say like the, the really boring pedestrian, but often, you know, truthful, truthfully useful way is just, um, you know, if you're, if you're walking in trying to replace a human being, you need a model that's already highly accurate to, to even have a minimum. Like we talk about MVP in, in startups all the time. We're all familiar with the idea, like your, top, your, your, your product has to reach some minimum threshold of functionality for it to be worth adopting. I think the same is true on the data side. There's like a, a minimum viable data set um, or a minimum viable accuracy for your model that differs depending on the problem. And um, if, if, you're, if you're trying to replace a human, the minimum viable accuracy is actually really high. But if you're walking in um, with some useful workflow that doesn't even need to make a prediction and you know, that's something you can add six months from now, then your minimum viable accuracy is zero. You can walk in and say, you know, hey, on day one, um, this is just workflow, but as you use it, we're going to accumulate data or the, or we can get enough data pulled out of your historical, you know, we're going to integrate with your ERP system, your customer, and we're going to pull enough data out of your ERP system that, you know, in a, in a two month onboarding window of labeling it, you know, we can make a model that, that makes good enough predictions to get going with you. So if, if your minimum hurdle is low enough that you can get over it with the first customer who's patient and helpful to you, um, then you start at one and you accumulate. And the beauty of it is that by the fifth customer, you know, you're starting to get data network effects. You're starting to see the compounding value of a more and more accurate model so that every, with each customer you sign up, every past customer really benefits because the model is getting better and better for them. So those are all, you know, the, the, the customer I think is, is, is what is my de facto expectation of the way that you're going to get your data. But there's definitely, um, there's definitely many, many more, uh, more shortcuts depending on what kind of, what kind of product you're building. And, and then question. how you're scrappy about labeling the data is the whole other question. Yeah. And, and we've seen all kinds of interesting approaches there. And anything to watch out in terms of labeling the data? Um, just that spending a fortune on it is, is usually not the answer. Just same as, you know, same as buying customers by spending a fortune on ads is, is usually not going to result in a, a healthy business. Neither is just sort of brute force, you know, paying a lot of low cost labor to, you know, task workers mechanical turking the, the data labeling. So usually you need to find something smarter than that, whether that's, that's building a tool um, or working out ways that your customers actually label the data in the course of working with it, um, you know, variety of ways. But, but definitely you can, you can go from like a great business to a terrible one if, if uh, data labeling consumes your margin. A lot of people are curious about um, how building AI company is different from building a any other kind of startups focusing on process. And uh, what are the, the common issues you see in the early stage, like seed, seed stage or even series A stage? Yeah, I think we've touched on the big one, which is this data acquisition problem, which by the way, is not a problem for every single AI startup. Um, I, I sit on the board of, of one company that's that's working with deep reinforcement learning. And so it, it basically creates its own data as it goes. But I think the vast majority of startups applying AI to solve problems you know, um, are, are doing so, um, 
uh, in, a, in a manner that, that requires data um, and that, that probably requires not just like an, an initial injection of data, but that, that sort of has an ongoing hunger for data to remain accurate, to, make, to remain relevant. Um, and so I think that that's, um, you know, to the extent that affects your business model, it does, it's uh, talked about with labeling costs. Um, but I think a lot of ways it, it, it does ref um, affect that seed stage because you have to think about, you know, I think that with SaaS companies in particular, there was this sort of predisposition that you could build a 1.0 pretty cheaply. You could raise a seed round of like 1 million, maybe 2 million and kind of, you know, in six months deliver a, a product that is, um, that is adoptable and has some value and show um, some early incremental sales and sort of within 12 months, be making a couple million in revenue and go raise this huge series A. Like, I think that had become kind of the standard track for, for SaaS startups um, and many consumer startups too. And I think that um, data hungry startups may take a little bit longer than that. Um, just because there is this bootstrap period where we're accumulating data to make the product better so we can accumulate data so we can make the product better. And it's a little bit more of a, a staircase than just sort of this straight rocket ship. Um, but I think nonetheless, even if it's like a little bit of a slower takeoff, I think it's so incredibly durable. I think a lot of those like fast growing SaaS companies, the thing about them is there's nothing fundamentally defensible about the business. If you can build the product in six months, so could the next guy to come along. And so... Um, what I think is really durable about these data power businesses is that you build a data moat. It's not just that it takes a long time to get this data. It's that even if somebody had, you know, a feature for feature exact copy of the software you've written, you know, by the time you're on your 10th customer's worth of data, the recommendations you're making, the insights you're giving, the accuracy of your model is so much higher that they can't catch up because they can never beat you head to head. You always have an edge. You're always delivering better functionality. And the value you're creating for your customers is compounding too. It's not just that your product's getting better and better and therefore your margins get better and better. It's that your customers are seeing more and more value over time. And that creates loyalty. Like ultimately at the end of the day, um, creating a business is all about doing right by your customers and giving them a ton of value. And so I think that like that sort of slower build, but sort of long durable stickiness, um, you know, that's, that's the curve I hope to see in an, in a, in an AI startup. I should hasten to add all with the B2B lens consumer, a little bit different. Yeah. And then the question uh, the audience have is um, when they building a prototype and they're sort of curious how perfect or how ready the prototype uh, needs to be before they can start having a, a meaningful conversation with semesters. Um, it does not need to be perfect or good at all. Um, I had a, a pitch earlier this week with a, a founder who had spent three days kind of building really a clickable mock-up of what he had in mind. But that was still super valuable because walking through that, I had like, oh, that's what you're building. Now I understand. Oh, you're not targeting... Um, you're not, you're not targeting like a content creation editor. You're talking, you're, you're building a platform for delivering and wrapping analytics around content that already exists. Um, and so, so like, if, you know, the cliche, a picture speaks a thousand words. Well, a demo speaks a million. So I think that um, you can have a conversation at any point in time. Now, whether investors will back you completely dependent on the investor and what stage they invest at. Some investors invest at the stage of founder and idea. And if you're raising money at the founder and idea stage, bring a demo by all means. Um, if you, but there are other investors that you can really only approach when you have something built. And those investors are ones that do not want to, if you, if you think about what investors do, you know, at each stage, we specialize in taking a different kind of risk and, and, and we are knowledgeable about certain kind of risk. Um, and so the risk you take by investing at the founder and, and slide stage when everything's super unproven, among other things is you're taking invention risk. Like, is it even possible to do what you're saying you're going to do? So if you're coming to someone who's a seed stage investor like Zeta, we probably are not expecting to take invention risk. We kind of expect you to have, not to have commercialized it. We don't think you have millions of dollars of revenue. I'm expecting to take the product market fit risk. You come to me with technology that's working and I make my best guess of whether there's going to be a big market for it and whether you can execute on, on bringing that product to market. And then I underwrite your, the round that, that helps you develop and prove product market fit and, um, and go raise a big series A. And so, you know, if you want to raise money from, from someone who takes product market fit risk, you need to show them that the technology works, that they're not taking invention risk. So um, I think it's really, it just depends on knowing the investor and what types of risks they take and what types of risks they don't. And unfortunately, like the names of stages, like pre-seed, seed, series eight, like it's not super informative. Um, it's it, like, it's such a ballpark. And especially right. seed, what people mean by it is all over the map. So, um, 
you know, I think maybe the best thing sometimes is just to talk to other people who've raised from that investor or just to even open the conversation with the investor by asking them about their stage focus and like what's the earliest they invest and what's the latest. And by the way, we don't, you know, we don't go arbitrarily late either. Like investors all have a band, like they have a zone that they're good in. And, you know, I'm not going to go later than my range either. I'm much more likely actually to go earlier than my range than I am to go later than my range. Uh, uh, thanks, Jocelyn. This is all of my questions. And Patrick, take away to, uh, to, I'll hand it over back to you. Great. So Jocelyn, thanks for helping give a, a good high level introduction to this topic. We've invited about four different members of the community to join as live participants. Um, we're going to dig in specifically to some of the things that they are curious about. The first person I'd like to welcome up is Rishab Bhargava. He is a data scientist at Data Coral. Um, so Rishab, do you want to jump in and go for it? Hi, good to, uh, good to meet everyone. Thank you, Justin, for taking the time. This was super insightful. So Justin, broadly, you know, my, my sort of interest at this point is in sort of tooling with, with machine learning uh, and sort of data science folks. And I, I'd love to sort of uh, hear from you on what you think around you know, proving value right? for, for either a machine learning startup that has an interesting model or you know, people who are you know, building tools for them. You know, how do you think you know, where are the places that, uh, that folks struggle when, you know, it's like, this is the business value of this product or this tool? You know, my, I think we're still figuring this out as an industry. Um, uh, my, my credentials, we, Zetto, we're investors in Kaggle, which I think we will put loosely in sort of the tooling for data scientists category. Um, and we're also investors in a company called Domino Data Lab, which I think is doing a, a pretty good job being kind of the enterprise IDE model management platform um, and, and competing very successfully at that kind of, you know, Fortune 500, Global 2000. Um, so we know a little bit about this. And I would say that to me, um, it resembles the market for software engineering tools, I believe to a point. Um, I think that, that, you know, what we learned about IDEs and source control and bug tracking is that, um, it can be sold in kind of direct enterprise sales to leaders, especially if it's something like where there's already a category where there's already budget and you know you know you need um, source control. And so you can come in and say, hey, actually you should you should be buying GitHub Enterprise, you know, per force is so 10 years ago. Um, I think that to sell something fundamentally new um, is much more likely if it's B2D, if you're selling to the, the individual practitioner um, and they're giving pull. And that is because um, just this is this is a class of worker that can't really that's, that's creative that's talented that uh, you know there's a tremendous supply demand disparity so we have you know as engineers we have tremendous freedom to kind of write our own ticket and go where we want and so when we um, and frankly we're the only ones technical enough to know what tools help us so when we go to the bosses and tell them what we need we tend to get it. Um, and if a boss comes to us and says here I bought this tool for you and we don't want it we're kind of like the. You know, it can make us. So, um, so I think that we'll probably see that same kind of thing in data science and machine learning. And so I really like the B2D kind of business model for something that an individual is going to use. I think it doesn't have to be open source, but I think often that can be helpful for gaining loyalty and gaining mindshare. And I think proving value just comes down to, you know, the experience of the person using it. And, and do they feel more productive and do they, do they feel that it gives them value? And, and I think that you can help them, you know, once you have like a lot of grassroots adoption and you're helping them kind of roll it up into doing a site-wide license or whatever, like then you can come along with ROI studies about productivity or time savings or whatever. But, mm -hmm. but I think that just having a product people love is the key in that sort of B2D sale. If it is something that is more of an enterprise-wide sale because it involves, you know, collaboration, it's a standard that everybody has to agree on, or it's sort of auto ML or, or, or a data ingestion platform, or just, you know, just something that's sold um, more at a corporate level than an individual level, you know, then I think that it has to be a little bit more of an ROI-led story. And I think that what I'm seeing is, you know, people have their hair on fire, they're chasing tons of different problems. Um, cost savings alone is not enough because there's infinity ways they could try to save money. Um, so it has to stand out as addressing one of their top few problems. And I think in particular, you have to look really hard at what people are getting from their cloud provider, from Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, because by and large, especially enterprise IT, seems dis default disposed to, hey, I'll take, I'm not trying to innovate on having better tools than everybody else. I'm just going to take what Google gives me or what Amazon gives me or Microsoft. And so you can absolutely still carve out space for yourself. I think Snowflake's a great example of that as a startup who's providing something that is, you know, now competing head on with cloud providers and winning. Um, 
but it, it becomes much more about unique differentiation, a functionality they cannot get anywhere else that they feel that they've got to have. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for the question, by the way. I think it's, uh, I think about this all the time. So in terms of like a quick follow-up, mm. um, is there, is there anything different or have you seen interesting pricing models work out? Uh, as uh, you know, people figure out, you know, this is a product that this data scientist likes, or maybe there's a company-wide appeal, so there's an enterprise license. Is it, do we just follow sort of uh, enterprise software models here, or is there some different value-based pricing uh, that can be thought of as well? It's tough to get value-based pricing on seat level productivity. I think if you make a, a, a worker more productive, my, my bias is you should be charging by the seat. And you can certainly, you know, that could be, freemium and then as 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 you know and then there's functionality that is behind the paywall and usually the functionality is things like analytics is things like collaboration it's stuff that you don't need if you're one guy in his dorm room doing a school project but it's stuff that you absolutely need if you're you know a team of 10 people building a software product to, to commercialize so that's um um so i think that's you know, the, the, there's there's no need to really innovate on on pricing in that sense. I think if you're if you're a platform for executing models for managing or monitoring models, think like then then I think you know I would certainly look at APM pricing for inspiration. Mm -hmm. I think um, you know I, again I value based be careful with, but I think transaction based. Like if you can tie, customers are so allergic to the concept of value-based pricing that you always want to sort of figure out on what dimension you create value for them and see if you can charge, you know, a share of that so that you essentially, you end up approximating value-based pricing without saying that, you know, without, because you're, you're there to serve your customer, not to, not to exploit them. And I, you know, I think in enterprise sales, it's really, it's really partnership kind of fundamentally, especially, especially in the startup days. I mean, they are your reason for existence, like serving and solving their problems is your reason for existence, but, but also like they're taking a huge risk to bet on a startup. So I'm not saying that you, you shouldn't charge what the software is worth, but I'm saying that it has to, the, the pricing has to come in a form that's palatable to them and to, that to them is really commensurate with the value, not just commensurate with the value they're getting, but also that is predictable to them. That's not going to surprise them. That was great, Jocelyn. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Praveen Amancherla, CTO at Merit. Praveen, do you want to jump in? It is a, uh, Jump in with your, your questions and, and topic you want to dig into. Sure, thank you. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, very, very helpful for me. The biggest takeaway was uh, how the workflow automation SaaS startups are indefensible and how uh, data for startups can really create a competitive mode that was really insightful. But however, that also places a lot of burden on high quality data, right? And you kind of mentioned a couple of ways on acquiring the data. Mm -hmm. So my question is specifically on acquiring uh, enterprise data. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any challenges? Because on one side, you keep reading all these articles saying that data is the new gold and people are so productive of data. So if I were in an early stage AI startup and I went to like a large enterprise, like, you know, somebody who has a lot of customer support data, for example, wherein I want to build a natural language processing, uh, for example, right? Are you seeing any apprehensions or fears from these large enterprises in sharing the data? And number two, is there any messaging that the startups can do to ease that apprehension? Um, so I think that um, enterprises are cautious, but by and large, the, the companies that it has backed, what, what we're seeing in the market is that enterprise are absolute, enterprises are absolutely sharing those data with the startups and giving the startups the right to use it. Um, not just the right to use it for them, but the right to train their models on it and share them. So, you know, if I, um, you know, if I have a bunch of insurance companies as my right. customers, as State Farm and Progressive and AXA, that I can't, I can't take AXA's data and share it with State Farm, but I absolutely can train my model to be smarter um, on AXA's data and that, and that model can, can run on State Farm queries and deliver value. So that, um, that is getting done. Enterprises are doing that. And I think there's a few things to be careful of. You know, a huge one is compliance and GDPR, especially if you have customers in heavily, heavily regulated industries. But I think in all industries, you know, you gave the example of customer data and that would be sensitive. Um, and so yeah, absolutely it is a must that you have to obfuscate or anonymize all PII data. Um, it is also the case that um, uh, you, you generally have to protect that you will not um, share their data with, with someone else. You're serving their market, you're serving their competitors. 
um, but by and large, they understand that your product relies on data to deliver the recommendation. And if that's what they value, then they have to give you the ability to make your model smarter based on their data. And that enterprises seem to understand and seem to, to cooperate with, to collaborate with. So I think that that's, I would, you know, if you as a founder were thinking about getting going, but were worried if that would be um, an unnatural obstacle, you know, I'd certainly arrange to do some customer discovery in your vertical. Um, but, but by and large, I would say go for it. It's, uh -huh. it's that kind of thing gets shared. Got it. And then also in terms of training the models, right? So mm. let's say I have two large enterprises and going back to your example of progressive and all state, right? Mm. Obviously, you know, more data, the better the model. Uh, but are you seeing, uh, you know, uh, any legal roadblocks uh, in cross training anonymous data? Like, you know, let's say I have customer support calls from all state from progressive. Obviously, these are all in the same business domain, mm -hmm. but obviously owned by different companies. Yeah. Uh, is it a you know the the wall? Is it pretty tightly enforced? Um, you've got to. It's got to be anonymized. Of course, you've got to get the contractual rights to train your model on that data. Um, but I think by and large, what our companies are seeing is that as long as you promise not to share the raw data, you you do get the rights to train your model and make your product better got with on. with all the and with, with the pooled customer data. Got it. Great. And, and, and that's, and that's incredibly valuable, of course. Yes. I mean, it lends itself, you know, for lots of startups, they have a vertical centric go to market. I think for AI startups, it makes a lot of sense to have a verticalized product for exactly that reason, because, you know, if you, you know, a million customer contacts of insurance companies is going to result in a model that's way more accurate than a million customer conversations that are spread across 50 verticals or even 10. Got it. And, uh, one final question on, uh, you know, your classical uh, holy grail of B2B startups is seven to eight years to get to a hundred million ARR. Are any of those yardstick different for investors for uh, data and AI startups? I think we're still finding out. I mean, if you think about it, 2012 is eight years ago. You know, meaningfully, there were not a ton of B2B AI startups getting off the ground in 2012. Zeta was formed in 2013. Right. And I would say with optimism anticipating a wave of AI powered B2B startups. Um, but in the early days, we certainly found that, but we found lots of, you know, analytics and big data in the early days too. So I think we are just starting to find out. I think we're in the early innings. Great. Thanks, Justin. Mm, thank you. But let me know about Merit. Oh, sure. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Praveen. Um, next up, we have Nazrul Islam. He is the Senior Director of Engineering at CloudBees. Nazrul, would you like to jump in and dig into your topic? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, making time, Jocelyn. So um, I recently graduated from uh, Ross and uh, put together a pitch deck uh, in the AI ops area. Mm -hmm. um, so my first question is, what do you think of intelligent cloud operations uh, and the ADI in general? Um, I love it. I'm super passionate about it. I spent seven years at VMware and, you know, I think that we were all pretty, you know, excited about ourselves for, 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 for building a hypervisor that worked, but then the true value of, of that hypervisor was unlocked where we started building management tools on top of it. Like it wasn't just that you could pile 20 VMs onto a single physical server. It was once the server was virtual and not physical, you could teleport it. You could dynamically manage resources. It was all the things that hypervisor enabled. And so, um, you know, when I think about modern cloud infrastructure, it's way more um, efficient than anything and, and flexible and agile than anything that we had 20 years ago, but it's still got so far to go. And I think that we still in some ways have not refreshed, you know, the systems, the systems management stack of your is gone, is dead. And, um, and, but, and we're still figuring out what the new systems management stack is. Obviously the cloud provider is managing everything from the hypervisor down, but there's still so much complexity um, sitting above that level. I'm on the board of one startup called Upsani that um, uses deep reinforcement learning to do performance tuning. Of, of, your, of the infrastructure settings for a cloud-based application and, you know, can find incredible inefficiencies in modern cloud workloads. So I think that there are so many good problems and valuable problems to solve. And, and you know, I don't think of this as just a cost savings play either. First of all, um, I think that like to enable humans to be much more efficient and much more strategic, like to give more flexible infrastructure is just like an amazingly powerful lever for all the software that gets built on top of the cloud infrastructure. But by the way, if we can, you know, if we can you know, cut the compute required for a workload by a third, then you've actually like, you've made a dent in CO2 emissions because you're requiring less energy to, to power the same workload. So I think there's, um, you know, I think it's like, this is, I think infrastructure is one of the most fundamental levers. It's one of the best places to innovate because everything on top of that infrastructure gets lifted up and made better. 
Right. So, for so yes, in short, <laughs> the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. So follow up question is, uh, what do you look for? Uh, so I, you know, I worked in the industry for 20 plus years, you know, I have some uh, co-founders. Um, I have uh, raised some, you know, pre-seed money. Um, um, I, you know, one of our co-founders sent you our side deck also. So clearly that didn't make the cut. So without sharing a lot of <laughs> insights, you know, if you can uh, give us, you know, I think, you know, this forum would, you know, benefit from that knowledge is, like, if you can give us some high level on what should I have done to kind of get more traction with you? You know, sometimes it's just timing. So I think this is, this is actually one of the, the kind of black box parts of VC that I didn't really understand until I was on the inside of it, which is, you know, in any, in any time you send a pitch to a VC, you're not actually sort of comp- competing with some arbitrary standard or criteria to, to get their attention. You're competing with everything else that hit my inbox that day. I see. And like in any given week, I can, you know, I'm juggling, taking first, assessing decks and whether I'm going to take a first meeting. I'm taking first meetings and trying to decide whether there should be a second meeting. And I'm in the diligence process with a bunch of companies. So, um, so if you hit me when I'm doing 20 other things, you may fall below the cut line not because there's some box it doesn't check, but just because there's 20 things on my plate that are more urgent. Um, and, and then, and then it's, uh, and, and like, it, it, it's, it's so weird to say to founders, like you're competing with each other in that way, but, but it's kind of true. And so this, this last month or so, um, if it was, if it was recent, I mean, has been a, a pretty chaotic period and one where I'm sinking a lot more of my time than ever into working with my current portfolio companies to make sure that we've got all that, that we kind of have battened down the hatches. Um, but I'm happy to I'm happy to check my inbox and 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 find it. We'll take it offline, but I'm happy to take a look. Yeah, thank you, thank you for uh, that uh, uh, context. Because one of the things I was trying to evaluate myself is is the timing bad because of COVID? Should I continue to try to raise seed fund now, or should I wait a little bit longer? You know, so I was trying to. So if you have any advice around the pandemic and raising funds now, like what would you advise? Um, I would, uh, I would, I started a company in, um, in December of 99 and we raised money in, uh, February of 2000. So that was for those old enough to remember that was, that was the beginning. That was the tech com, the, the dot com bust. That was the, the, you know, the meltdown. Um, I think it was a time, I, I really feel like we got a term sheet a minute before the funding window slammed shut and it did slam shut. I think the lesson of both that dot com bubble burst and the 2008 recession is that great companies were formed during the recession. Um, that, that recessions could be great times to build a company um, because there's a lot less distraction and competition. I mean, here in the Bay Area, it's going to be a lot more, it's going to be a lot easier to hire. It's going to be a lot easier to get commercial real estate. There's going to be a lot less distraction. Also because I think big enterprise customers to take the risk of adopting from a startup or any customer, it doesn't have to be enterprise. It can be a consumer. Why would you sleep on an air mattress on somebody's, in somebody's living room um, instead of booking a hotel room? And for that matter, why would you allow a stranger to sleep on an air mattress in your living room? And the answer is because you're both broke, right? Airbnb got off the ground in, during the recession for exactly that reason, because it, was, it gave people an existential reason to contemplate change, to take a risk. Um, and so I think, that, that, I think that VCs have learned and every VC I know says, my checkbook's open, I'm investing through this recession. Now, I think the reality is it's a little bit dependent on the timing um, for the VC on where they are in their, in their fund deployment cycle. So if they're close to the end, if they're almost out of money in their current fund, and they have not already raised their next fund, they're in a little bit of a pinch because now is a really lousy time for a VC to fundraise. Um, it's really difficult for us to raise money without seeing people in person face to face. Um, and is also the people we raise money from, the big institutions, they themselves may be facing a crunch because they have big portfolios that span public markets, real estate, other areas that might be pinching them. So now is a tough time for VCs to fundraise. But if the VC has raised a fund within the last you know, 12 to 18 months, chances are they're actively in market and they know this is a good time to deploy new capital and put it to work, especially at the early stage. So, you know, I would do your homework on the firms and, and, you know, we all like to make a fuss when we raise a fund. So you'll, you can find our last press release and see how old it is and, and, and probably estimate whether we have dry powder or not. Um, so in that sense, um, no, I don't think it's a bad time to fundraise. I don't think it's, I think it's a, an excellent time to start a company. I think it's an excellent time to fundraise. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it just sort of goes back to your competition is with all the other things hitting our plate. And, and maybe that is where a little bit of craftsmanship or polish on the deck or the email or how the introduction gets made 
you know, maybe those kinds of things can help you stand out or get attention. Um, but, you know, also sometimes you just have to be persistent. I've never met a founder who didn't have a story about being rejected dozens of times before they finally found their investor. So, you know, fundraising is, is never easy at any time. Um, but it's, uh, but I think that, that, you know, persistence and hard work, and I'm not just saying this as the check writer, but as someone who's just gone through the process of fundraising, we talked to a lot of people to raise our last fund, um, and it was hard work and it was grueling, frankly. Um, but I think if you have fundamentally a strong team, a strong idea, a strong market, if the fundamentals are there, you will be able to raise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasrul. Um, and Jocelyn, thank you for peeling back the, the black box of VC and talking about timing. I think that's something that's been on a lot of people's mind here. And so Bupesh, uh, would lo love to bring you up. Bupesh Bansal, come on in, ask your question. Hey, hi, uh, Jocelyn. Thanks a lot for your insight. Really, really helpful. Uh, I want to come back to what Praveen was talking about as well. Like, you know, the chicken and egg problem of uh, data collection for AI for startup. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, one problem, and I'm an active investor. I'm not a data scientist. I'm a data infrastructure person. So, mm -hmm. you know, some of the complexity I might not understand really well. Uh, I have a couple of investments I made, you know, it was very hard to find the balance between the ambitious problem they're trying to solve and whether that was practical given the data acquisition they can do realistically. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to estimate the quantity and quality of data they can really acquire. Mm -hmm. so I think like, you know, how do you really judge that and how do you make a call on the future possible collection of data quality and quantity, which will give them the power to build the kind of products and feature they're talking about now and trying to sell now? Well, it's obviously much easier to raise the call, to make that call if they've already collected some data. I mean, don't underestimate how much if investors say no today, you know, go make more progress and try again. It doesn't mean they don't like you. It might mean that they just don't know whether you're going to be able to get the data. And if you go get the data, then that box is checked. Um, so, you know, flipping it to the investor lens, you know, how can you be sure? I mean, obviously, if they've collected some data, that's a very good sign. And, you know, it doesn't even, you can be forward leaning about this, right? Like, you know, something that I often discuss with the founders is, okay, you know, how much data have you collected so far? What is, how do you measure accuracy in your model? And where did it start? And how is it improved over time? And so even if model accuracy is not yet very good, if I can see that it's sort of, you know, it started low and it's been steadily improving and they, you know, have a set of plans to get here, mm -hmm. um, then I can kind of judge the, the, you know, from the trajectory, not the position. Um, I think that it's really tough at the founder and deck phase. We, to be honest, don't make that many investments that early. Um, and, and most of the time we invest, there is at least some data, enough data, maybe not enough to be production ready, but enough to show that the model can learn and improve with more data and, um, and that they have a plan to go get that data. So, you know, there's no magic to saying, you know, the, the way to deal with risk is to wait until that risk is taken off the table. But I think maybe it's helpful to founders to hear that that's how investors think that sometimes when they say <laughs> you're too early or or, you know, like, like we take that as like the Dear John rejection um, or, and means they'll never be interested in us. But, but actually, a lot of times it's just, you know, startups are a collection of risks. Investors are, you know, can take, can take some risks or can de-risk some things with my own research. I can take market risk by doing market research. I can take financing risk by looking at what later stage VCs than me like to finance. I can take, you know, market risk by calling customers and saying, would you buy this, right? Like I can research those kinds of risks and form conviction um, or because I know the space really well. It's hard to take and mention risk because there's not a lot I can do to de-risk it other than you building some more. Um, and I would say that like the data acquisition risk is kind of right in there with, with it's not quite invention risk because saying I know how to build this is, you know, mm -hmm. kind of has to be accepted or not accepted on, on faith. But, but saying like, here's my plan to acquire the data. Like I can look at that plan and say, that'll, that's a good Got plan it. or that's not a good plan, but is the data actually going to be valuable? Is the, is the data actually going to solve the problem? That's kind of resembles invention risk. And, um, and that's where I think having a little bit of knowledge as a machine learning practitioner and someone who's been adjacent to machine learning to practitioners, I think can help you a lot. You can think about, Hey, is this the kind of problem, you know, I, I I mean, I, I really will get back to you. Like, if to go back to the, the litmus test of if someone can have, talk through a conversation with me about feature engineering and say, these are the features that I think you're going to be predictive of X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to get this data that has these features, and that's how I'm going to make prediction X, Y, and Z. Like, I feel pretty comfortable then, you know? I mean, I think like my own human brain can assess the validity of that 
of that story and, and accept or deny it. Whereas someone who's just like, oh, my AI, you know, sounds a lot like a human being behind a curtain. Mm -hmm. Man, I, you know, I, I just don't think that, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to bet on you hiring a data scientist in the future who's going to figure it out for you. Like I'm, I'm rarely going to, you know, it's not that it's too risky for you to be able to hire a data scientist, but it's too risky that you've actually got a good idea if you don't got know it. how to implement it. Uh, let me ask you a follow-up question, and this is uh, might be a little bit funny. Uh, mm. I want to build a startup to pitch a VC at the right time. You know, <laughs> what is the right time? So, and like I'm just starting. Uh, so, how do I go about you know uh, acquiring data and building such a startup? What should be my next step? That's you know, super interesting. Um, I think you'd have to start by brainstorming like what are the features that might predict that. And I do think that um, you know like some obvious things are some of the things I've talked about just now, like have I recently raised a fund? Like, do I have fresh capital or am I, you know, am I in a reserves crunch? Um, there's, do I, uh, there's maybe the pattern of the timing, the seasonality of mm -hmm. when I've invested in the past. But I think that some of that might be spurious. Like the, the, vo the volume, a lot of investors, institutional investors are making two, three investments a year. So I think any seasonality pattern, even over, you know, 10 years might be somewhat spurious. Um, and also might be linked to the startup's behavior rather than the VC's behavior. Like startups definitely cluster when they fundraise. But the point I made about like going when the VCs are, are more busy or less busy, like mm -hmm. everybody advises startups to raise um, ahead of the holidays or after them because um, mm -hmm. you don't want to get stuck in the holidays. Well, that's truly good advice. But I will tell you that starting about late, the last week of September through to the first week of November, I am bombarded with pitches because every startup is trying to follow that advice. So that's like the worst time to send me a pitch because mm -hmm. I just have to, like one that I would gladly take a meeting with in March, I have to say no because there's five more interesting pitches in my inbox um, that week. So, so definitely like figuring out the, that kind of peak time. Um, and I, that'd be tricky data set to get because pitch book, you know, you can, or Crunchbase, um, you know, the paid licenses will tell you when funding rounds are announced. Yep. They can even tell you when sometimes the paperwork is filed. But there's, it's so idiosyncratic, like when the pitch hits my inbox to, you know, the first and second meeting to the due diligence process, like that amount of time can be five days or can be 40 days. Um, and then even from term sheet to close is another pretty fuzzy mm -hmm. window. And then from close to announce is... You know, I don't think the announcement data is very useful at all. So, yeah, I don't know where that data set would come from unless you could persuade VCs to hand it over. Um, you know who has that data is, um, is uh, Affinity, the Affinity. CRM that yeah. serves VCs. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if they have the rights to, to, to provide that data. And the, the founders have the data, like, you know, if I can get founders email and I can see when BC responded to them, if I have a collection, I can do yeah, something. Yeah, you can work it from the founder end for sure. But like each of them only has um, like their one funding event. One funding. Like you get one event, one time. Yep. And, well, you know, like they probably send tons of pitches. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's definitely an asymmetry in who has this data. I'd see, um, I talked to the guys at Affinity. No, it's a thought exercise. I was just thinking like, you know, if I think of a problem from scratch, you know, how can I reason about it? I think very good points and it gives me new perspective to think about the problem. Totally. So I've much. never thought about that before, but it's, I think, interesting. <laughs> I will say people, you know, I, maybe this is old, like, you know, in the 2000s, like people used to say that VCs take the summer off, don't bother pitching in the summer. As far as I can, I can tell, that is not true. I, we are as busy as ever and writing as many checks as ever all summer long. Um, I think especially at the seed stage. So I think the summer thing is a total myth. You're, you're good to, to, wait, to raise in the summer. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Vipesh, thank you for bringing that up and, and workshopping an idea in, in real life. I think it was really fascinating to see the thought process for how you design features for data. Um, that's great. But um, with that, I think we can, we can transition then, Jocelyn, if you're ready, to, to a couple of questions that have come in so far. Um, the, the first one that came in, so earlier you are talking about, um, talking about teams. Do you have an ideal team size and skill sets for an early stage startup that you that you assess? Not exactly. I mean, I think that if you're it, it's it's all relative to your funding and your traction. Um, I think that if you really are you know don't have any revenue yet, are really still at kind of the founder idea stage, you know, I think you're I, you're you're best off with not too big a group with two or three people because I think you just want to have a small, you want to have enough people for diversity of skill set. I think the solo founder, I'm fine with solo founders. I have back solo founders. Some VCs don't like them. I mean, I think it's lonely, but you 
surround yourself with, you recruit good teammates. Like recruiting is the solution to being a solo founder. Um, you know, I think two or three people is good to have a scan, a, a span of skill sets. But frankly, I think that founders and founding team members should be jacks of all trades. Like they should be able to build and to design and to talk to customers. Um, and, you know, founders early on in B2, on the B2B side should be, should, should, should buckle up and engineers are going to learn how to sell. And, um, and that's what you're going to do. That's the founding experience. And, um, and so, you know, I don't think the team has to be huge and has to sort of check the box of every business function that would exist in a big company. I think it's only at big companies that we need to really stratify roles and, and make people be specialists. So, um, and I think a small number of people are just much more likely to be super tight, super aligned, figure things out very, very quickly, and frankly, not spend too much money while you're figuring it out. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's kind of the, the imperative is to keep burn low. I, you know, this is kind of the, the lean startup ethos and I really believe it, which is to be very incremental to like, like your job as a founder, you know, you think it's to build a company, but it's not, it's to discover it's, it's, you know, you're Lewis and Clark discovering if there is in fact a gold mine, you know, over that mountain. And so, um, and so your job is to just have really tight, fast feedback loops and to build just enough to kick off the next feedback loop about whether what you're building is worthwhile. So, I, you know, I don't think you need a big team to do that. You need a big team once you know what to build, not while you're figuring out what to build. Um, and you need a big team to sell it once you know that it's saleable and you figure that out by selling it yourself. So I'm, I'm very much an incrementalist. I like the idea of, of starting small and sort of really validating, really proving things to yourself, really de-risking it before you spend more. And inevitably growing a team is growing your burn. Thank you. And I'm, I'm hanging out in the Pacific Northwest. So hearing a Lewis and Clark reference like makes my heart sing. That's incredible. <laughs> um, I know we have a couple more questions. Uh, I know, Jerry, do you have a, a couple questions you want to jump in with? Yeah, um, since we have no time, there's uh, one question I wanted to ask earlier, but uh, I'm afraid if we don't have enough time. But I'm really curious, um, uh, Justin, can you share, like you were an um, engineer leader before for a long time, and uh, I'm curious, how did transition happen from an engineer leader to a team master? Um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty winding route. Um, I... So I had been an engineering lead, an engineer my whole life. Um, had had co-founded a startup in 2000, but was the engineer there, um, and then was at VMware for a very long time. Grew up with VMware, rose from engineer to engineering leader. Um, was in a leadership role at Facebook after that, and um, you know, sometime around the time when I'd been an engineering manager for about 15 years, I was just starting to feel like I was hitting diminishing marginal returns, like like you know, that whole idea of, you know, feedback loops, sort of like for most of my career, I felt like every year I was confronted with challenges that were twice as big as the year before. And, and I was growing to meet them. And, you know, sometime around 15 years of doing the same job, it was just like, it was, it's really hard to keep doubling what you know how to do in a year anymore. Once, once you already know a lot of stuff, I don't want to sound like I think I had the job nailed or was perfect at it or knew everything, but it was, it was no longer, I could no longer see a doubling where my next doubling was going to come from. And so I thought, boy, um, Maybe my 20s and 30s were for growth and my 40s and beyond will just be for, you know, maybe it was explore, two decades of explore and now it'll be decades of exploit. Um, and I thought about that for a second and I thought, nah, I, you know, I'm not, I'm just not ready to be done. Um, I am not ready to plateau or, or cruise. And so I got to go be a rookie again. And so I formed this idea that I needed to, to try a different career, hopefully one that would build on the skills that I had. And, you know, I think the idea that occurred to me is one that, occur to a lot of us has occurred to a lot of you, which is I should go start a company um, and be a founder and add entrepreneur. And, um, and I thought about that, but I also, I really did not want to start a company for the sake of creating a job for myself, like for, for whose mission was to create a cool new job for me. Right. I, I think that, I think great companies, great startups are made when you have a mission that you are passionate to solve. It doesn't mean you have to be wedded to every particular of the idea, but it's your passion to solve the problem that keeps you going when times are tough. And so I thought, um, all right, well, I don't have that mission yet. I've got to find some way to find that mission. Um, and I thought if I'm sitting here, you know, working really hard, this demanding job at Facebook, like I'll be completely busy and consumed and I won't 
you know, I just, it will be hard to be creative in my office. I'm just not a person who, you know, does side gigs and side hustles, like whatever I'm doing, I do it a thousand percent. And so, and I was at Facebook going a thousand percent. And so I thought, um, I just have to, to leave and, um, and do something else and, and, and give myself the time and space to figure this out. And so I was really attracted to the EIR program at VC firms, the entrepreneur in residence as sort of a place for experienced execs to kind of sit around and figure out, think, do exactly this. Um, but I thought, I don't want to be beholden to any one particular firm. I kind of had this idea that, you know, I don't know if those VC people are fun to hang out with anyway. Um, and so I thought I will just hang out my shingle as an angel investor and it'll be like a DIY EIR program for myself. So I left Facebook announcing that my next career was to angel invest. I made a, you know, angelist profile. I, you know, updated my LinkedIn page. I, um, and I, you know, talked to all the people I knew who were entrepreneurial and sort of, and, and followed up and um, one thing led to another and I started meeting founders and I started mentoring with different entrepreneurship programs and, um, and I got pretty involved, um, investing and, um, and advising startups over the next two years and somewhere around a year or so in, I realized that um, more than any one mission, I was really excited about helping these companies. It just felt so leveraged to take all the things that I knew how to do and try to apply them across many companies and not just do one. And, um, and I was really, I loved that leverage. And, um, and I love the idea, you know, I think at seed stage, we're the, we're the, we're kind of the, we're the product market fit capital, you know, I'm not the growth capital. And that's the stage that's super exciting to me. That's formative. Um, so there's a lot of things. And, and I will say also that like, if your goal is to always keep learning and growing, to never slow down, um, to never get comfortable, then VC is a really great fit because there's always something new to learn. Um, whether it's the, the practice of VC itself, the mechanics of the job, which I assume eventually one can master, but um, certainly I have not. Um, but also just there's constantly new spaces, new technologies, new problems. So, you know, if you're intellectually curious, the job's a buffet. I'm not trying to recruit you all into being investors. Like there's some things about the job that, that you know, um, are, are not as glamorous as portrayed. And, and I also think that entrepreneurs are doing nobler work, um, um, which is why I'm, I feel so grateful to get to support you. But um, yeah, no, I just, uh, somewhere around a year or so into angel investing, I really fell in love with the craft of investing. And, um, and, I was, and I was meeting lots of investors as well. And so I just had the very good fortune um, Diane Green was a, always a mentor of mine after my long stint at VMware and she introduced me to Zeta and, um, and they were looking for a partner and, uh, and I happened to also, you know, being at Facebook, you can't, you couldn't be at Facebook from 2010 to 2014 and not emerge it's just sort of a true believer in the power of machine learning and, and what it can do. And so the idea of, of building a firm around investing into the, the new generation of companies enabled by this new platform just seemed so obviously right to me. And then yeah. as far as the B2B focus, you know, um, I don't know. I love to work. I've always loved to work. I've always been more interested in work than, than recreation. And so I'm more interested in, um, in solving the problems of how people work than the problems of how people entertain themselves. So, um, so that just, uh, that was also a big draw to me. Yeah, I can totally resonate with that. And, and since we're sharing <laughs> our journey, because uh, there are a lot of people in the community that are sort of established and are in, interested to not necessarily doing investing full time, but they want to get involved. And, you know, who knows, maybe as they get more involved, they, they're, you know, um, end up being a full time investor. And uh, so that the journey just shared is, uh, I think, it's, can be inspiring to, to a lot. I, you know, I definitely think that, like, all startups are roller coasters. Like, like there is the, 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 the sort of the, the, the rock, the, the, the myth of the rocket ship startup that's just sort of straight up into the right is, is baloney. There's, there's no startup, no matter how successful that hasn't had its share of near death experiences. So I think it's really, um, you know, I think it, it takes a certain, um, uh, I think you've got to be buckled up for that um, and have the kind of, the calm and the equanimity to, to make it through the dips and the, and the rises. And, you know, I think if you have investors who appreciate that, they can be real assets to the entrepreneurs they work with. Yeah. On, on this topic, Justin, we had a, a question that just came in, um, especially like with how you first got involved with in, investing, do you still do angel investing? And, and if you do, how different or similar is your investment thesis from that of, of Zetas, if you're able to, to share that? No, you put your finger on it. I, I cannot an angel invest any longer. Um, it's just because it would be a conflict with Zeta. Um, so I think I, um, I, can st I still can invest 
into small VC funds. So that's sort of the second order. Um, I can do that, um, but I cannot directly invest in, in mm-hmm. uh, software companies anymore. For, for precisely that reason, that even if even with a different thesis, you know, if it's an early stage tech startup, um, you know, it's it's not a good look if I'm spending a lot to, to my investors, if I'm spending my time shepherding other startup companies and not the ones that their money is part of. And and it's really not a good look if I invest in something that turns out to be super successful and, and my money's in it, but theirs isn't. So, yeah, just too much room for it's easier for I mean, later stage <laughs> investors because there's like a much brighter line where, you know. Hey, I'm investing in seed stage companies with my own money, but like our fund would never invest in that. And if it does well, my fund can get into it. Um, but it's uh, for a seed stage investor, it's just there's no bright line. I think that's a consideration that that for me was was never would, would never have been top of mind without you highlighting that. So, is there a way like how has your investment thesis evolved since you've gotten more? experienced in, in this and have have seen a lot of things come your way like has your point of view changed dramatically yeah i mean i think i had a sort of typical engineer's appreciation for like the really hard part is building this technology and as long as you have like valuable differentiated technology like we'll find a way to to build a business around that and i think you know i mean i think i would have always um you know mentally had appreciation for but i think living through it you have a much more visceral emotional appreciation for it is every bit as hard to build a business to commercialize a technology as it is to invent it. And like as engineers, we cannot write off that side. And, you know, it's far more common to have a technical founding team that succeeds at building the thing and fails to sell it than the other way around. And that, that doesn't mean that I don't like to back technical teams anymore that don't have a sales guy in the founding team. I think a sales guy is a waste of time in a founding team because there's nothing for them to sell the year one. Um, it's more, you know, I have become much more alert to the importance of, you know, it's really hard for customers to buy from an early stage startup. And so they have to be really, 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 it has to be not just a good idea, but like an insanely compelling idea. They have to be absolutely desperate. You know, I I cannot possibly live without your product to take the plunge of committing and, and making a real, you know, business investment in something from a startup. And so that's, um, and so that I think is, is most often something I assess by talking to customers. If you have some pilots, if you have some customers and I'm able to talk to them, that makes it infinitely more likely that I'll be able to figure out, okay, this customer pool exists and, and I can safely invest here. Um, but if not, I do the next best thing and I talk to people in my network who are potential customers of this product um, and ask them, you know, hey, at face value, how likely, how much do you need this? Is this a big problem for you? And, and, and that ends up being... Um, you know, what I rely on, of course, when I'm doing that, you're at the mercy of how well I explain what you do, which, you know, I may be a pretty flawed messenger of your vision. Um, but so having those ties to people who can potentially buy is, um, is actually like super important, super valuable. And so depending on the sector, like if you're an in infrastructure, I have tons of those ties. I know lots of people who buy infrastructure. If you're selling, you know, insurance software, I may have to go find new, new, uh, new, new relationships to, to figure it out. So that's all been part of the journey uh, into being a good investor. Wonderful. Um, one final question for you. So, yeah, since we, we, we first started off with Ender's Game and with Influence, uh, the, the last question that came in is, you know, do you have any books or I think really more broadly, like any resources mm. that on the topic of AI and startups that you might recommend to everybody? Well, it's sort of a Homer's pick, but I got to recommend that as blog. Um, we actually do a ton of writing on this topic. A lot of it's long form and we try to sort of go past, you know, I think there's like a version of VC blogging that's just like, hey, data modes, yay, you know, um, and we try to go and do the sort of 200 level version of that where we talk about how it affects pricing. We actually have an article article called data is not the new oil, um, or but I think we have another one called data rights are the new IP rights. So some of the things that we talked about even today, I think um, we've, we've, we've written about and are pretty useful. Um, what else? I think it is. You know, I think OpenAI is doing really terrific work on where the technology is moving, but my guess is this audience doesn't need help tracking the technology. Um, I think that for all the engineers on this call, I really want you to take to heart what I said, which is that you are going to have to sell your software. Like unless you're putting up something, unless you're putting up something for consumers to use, in which case you are going to have to market your own software. And so I think that, um, honestly going and seeking resources on how to do founder selling and founder marketing um, is incredibly useful to you, even if it's not AI specific. And for this, I love, um, uh, there's a book, an online book. It's free. I think it's called founder selling. It's by a gentleman named Pete Kazanji. Um, 
and uh, and he also runs like a, a founder group called Modern Sales, and um, it's such a good resource. And I, you know, I, half of you are sort of hearing that and going like, "Oh no, I didn't realize I had to do this." And you know, shoot, I better figure out how. And half of you are thinking, "It's okay, I'll find a business co-founder; they'll do it for me." And I'm here to tell you that. A pattern I have seen, I know this isn't the question you asked, but I've seen this so many times that talking to a room full of engineer founders, I have to say this, um, I've seen at least seven times this pattern of the, 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 the albatross business co-founder, where you have a technical team who has the idea, who understands the problem, but who's sort of afraid of the unknown unknowns on the business side and who runs around and tries to network and find a business co-founder. And so often um, that person's a millstone around your neck and it's terrible on both sides because there's really no selling to do in the first year. What there is is customer discovery. Someone who's a product manager, great, fine. They're useful to you in year one. Um, but you need to be in those customer discovery meetings. You can't outsource the voice of the customer. That's your whole product. That's your whole invention. Um, and you, you've got you to gotta be up close and personal with it. Um, and you cannot outsource figuring out pricing or packaging or positioning because all of those things are your product in the first two years. Um, and you cannot outsource selling it the first time because you think you're selling your product, but you're not. You're embarked on the journey of discovery of product market fit. And every single person that tells you no, how they tell you no, why they say no, all of that matters. Every question they ask, like that's all, that all feeds straight into figuring out if you have the right product um, and what you need to build. And so you cannot delegate that to somebody else as much as it may be out of your comfort zone. Um, and, and hiring someone who's, whose qualifications is that they've done biz dev doesn't mean they're entrepreneurial. doesn't mean they have the skills to help build the product. doesn't mean they have, you know, the, the even the, the, the intellect to be a jack of all trades. And so, you know, I would say don't, don't hire someone out of fear of what you don't know. Only hire people when you have an exact understanding of the work you need them to do. I think it's incredibly powerful straight talk to end our, our time together with don't hire somebody out of fear uh, and what you don't know. That's wonderful. Jocelyn, I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, but before everybody goes, there's a, one quick thing I wanted to invite people to share. The, the bad news and this is one of my favorite quotes, is that it's not the knowing that's difficult, but it's the doing. The hardest part is taking action. But the good news is that community like this causes action, but action only comes from sharing. So before we close, what I'd invite you to do is to share in the, the chat one small specific action that you're committed to taking. Is it a conversation you're going to have is it an idea you're going to research or validate? Is it a customer you're going to discover? Maybe it's a person you're going to ask to be a co-founder, or are you going to be the person who's going to quit their job in the middle of everything going on? Share one small specific action that you're, you're committed to, to taking. Um, and if you're, you're one of our panelists jumping on, if you, I'm inviting you to share live. I know people would love to be inspired to hear some of the things that you have to say. So what's, a, what's one small action that you're committed to taking around starting a, a company within the AI space? I think I can go first. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I'm committed to is, uh, is having sort of over the course of the next two to three months, um, having about 15 to 20 customer discovery conversations. I think there's a few ideas that are just jumping around in my head and I need to kind of have those conversations first. That's an awesome one. That's amazing. From my side, I'm actually very curious about uh, next-gen manufacturing with the uh, fear of global supply chains, I do see, I know it's not going to get disrupted overnight, but I do see certain emphasis on next-gen manufacturing and I do see a lot of uh, A applicability there, especially in terms of computer vision and stuff like that. Again, I have zero knowledge of any of that. I kind of like to jump into fire, if you will, and learn, uh, learn stuff. So I'm gonna commit myself to learn the domain and then you know uh, take uh, Justin's advice and actually speak to customers and see what pain points they have and if they're willing to share some data, I can start helping them with. That's awesome. Great, thank you, Praveen. I'll go next. Um, so two things, um, I actually uh, helped out one startup who was who were doing uh, discovery and I heard a lot about discovery today. I have done uh, quite a bit already, but I feel like I need to do more and more to validate and make sure that I really understand inside out of my problem space. And then the second thing I learned is don't worry about COVID, um, be persistent, keep trying, it'll happen. I'll, I'll keep trying. That's great. 
Thank you. Thank you three for, for sharing. Um, Jocelyn, again, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your insights with everybody um, here. But until next time, thank you all for joining and we will see you at, a, at another event. Thanks so much for assembling this group. It was really great having the conversation.